John Smedley, president of SOE. We're here at SOE Live, the 15th SOE Live, uh, talking about the year of EverQuest. Uh, tell me about what's going on at the event this year. Oh, we're really excited this year. Uh, we love coming to SOE Live every year. Uh, we get a chance to interact with our fans. This year it's really special too because for the first time we're really going to be showing a lot of EverQuest next. Yeah. We're going to be showing classes, we're going to be showing combat, uh, and we've re we're really showing the foundation that we built with Landmark and how we're bringing that into the full game EverQuest Next. So I'm, I'm really excited about sure. it. Sure, and uh, I was just listening to Dave Jordison talk about how EverQuest Next can't exist without that foundation of Landmark. That's it, right. EverQuest Next has been kind of quiet ever since last year's SOE Live, though, and he made a point of saying that that was because everything was going into Landmark. What, how do you see Landmark fitting into the landscape of what SOEs do? So, Landmark was never a product that we intended to make. It was. What, what happened was we started building the foundations for what we wanted to make with EverQuest Next in this massively changeable world. And as we got to making it, we're like, hey, building stuff is really fun by itself. What if we made a game out of that? Because we need to make all this stuff for EverQuest Next anyways. So it just kind of went together like peanut butter and jelly. I mean, right. It just worked really well. And it's been very much a building tool up until this point, but now yeah. you're, getting, you're actually adding monsters, you're adding uh, weapons, new abilities. It's becoming more of a game now, and That's not right. just a building simulator. That's right. It's like, um, you can think of it like we had you know, something like Minecraft without survival mode before. Well, now we're adding all the, the combat, the robust uh, gameplay that we've always wanted with it. Um, and then we're going to be able to take elements of that and put them right into EverQuest Next. So it's all this work that we've done is really starting to pay off. Is the is the technology that you have in Landmark going to end up affecting other games as well? It may. It may not just end up in those two. We really like what we've got here. And it's the kind of tech that we think could be used to make a lot of other games too. We're pretty excited about the building aspects of it. We think yeah. there could be a lot there. And it's it's kind of cool to see more game stuff coming out into it. I. I'm not a builder. I, I cannot make things, but it, will Landmark ever be a game that me as a non-builder will want to jump into and actually just play? Yeah, it will be. It's when we add the uh, the combat elements to it and more of the survival aspects. It's going to turn into a prop a game proper that even people like me and you who don't like to build. I'm sure. the same exact way. Um, I get excited by the catapult shots, uh, not <laughs> the shots of building. I want right. to see, you know, walls raised by a dragon, not. Not a, uh, uh, not somebody sitting there, ting, 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 building it. A lot of people love doing that. More power to them. Sure. Uh, I want to talk to you about H1Z1. Sure. Which uh, is really fascinating to me from the standpoint of, you guys announced it early, and you've been really transparent about the game that you're making and how you're making it. Uh, wouldn't you normally wait to tell us about a game like H1Z1? Isn't it a little early in the process to be introducing it to gamers? So. It is a little early in the process, as, as we're learning a little bit ourselves, in fact. Um, it, the, our desire to be transparent and to involve the community in the process is as important to us as the game that we're making. So what we're trying to do is put a, um, basically the, the core gameplay elements into this early access and then perfect them with the players instead of before showing it to them. So, uh, we're being super open about it and trying to get take their feedback into account as we're making it. We've never done that before, um, and it's pretty new for us, but it's going well. Is it a reaction to the success, or the mostly success, of early access games uh, on Steam, on other platforms? The idea of letting, kind of opening the kimono to the game development process for the players? I think it is. You know, we saw DayZ and Frankly, a lot of us played it and really like it a lot. Sure. Uh, rough around the edges, sure, as many of the other early access games are, as ours will be. But um, there was the a roughness to the game that actually made it even more fun for me, speaking for myself. And what we're trying to do is give players that want to be in that early kind of a game uh, the opportunity to not only see it and play it, but help us make it. Okay. And you mentioned DayZ. There's obviously a lot of similarities. Sure. What is it that's going to separate H1Z1 from the DayZ experience? Well, the single biggest thing is that we're an MMO, a persistent MMO. Uh, we will be running all of our own servers, although we will have a lot of them with different rule sets. So the fact that it's an MMO lets us evolve the world over time in ways that non-MMOs just can't, because it's got persistence to it. So you're going to see us start 
with a 64 square kilometer area and then just grow that out like crazy. Okay. So um, it's going to be a lot more dynamic. And you know we've we've had a lot of time to perfect our multiplayer code and our and our server backend. So you know you're going to be able to get all those conveniences and MMOs that you're that you're used to. But meanwhile, with the kind of gameplay that we think is really special in the survival field. Do you see a game like H1Z1 focusing more on emergent gameplay and kind of stories as they're happening with people, or will it be plotted out in the same way that like the EverQuest franchise is? This is absolutely about emergent gameplay. Um, and in fact, if you really analyze what survival gameplay, survival games are doing these days, it really comes down to it's this short story vignette kind of uh, thing going. You, you play it, you log in, you have an adventure. You may have several adventures, you may die several times. But it, the game, you could die and lose everything you, you spent two hours getting. Great. That's, that's the inherent risk in it. But what I really like about it is the vehicle that it is for a storytelling game. What, what do people get excited about in DayZ? You know, handcuffing some guy and pouring bleach down his throat. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've had it done to me, and I got to tell you, it was a hell of a lot of fun. Um, I mean, in a video game. It, it, in a video game, yes. <laughs> yeah. Let me be very clear about that. Um, but it, it really, I think, brings out um, sort of the funniness and the stories that people want to tell, gives them a vehicle to do that. That's a big change for the MMO space. You've been making MMOs for a very long time at SOE, and the idea of giving players control over the story as opposed to plotting out the next expansion, here's the series of quests, that's, that's kind of a sea change in the market, wouldn't you say? It is, um, and we're putting elements of that into all of our games. This emergent gameplay, um, this idea of it, has been around for a long time in the game industry. Well, we're putting a lot of that into our games because we can't possibly win the content race. That's why a game like H1Z1 makes a lot of sense, because what we're basically doing is, here's the weapons, guys, we're throwing them into the gladiator ring, um, or it's like Hunger Games, that first, you yeah. know, the first scene when they're all going for it. And what Racing we do is, for the yeah, yeah. We, make the, we make the rules, we, uh, we tell the players what the rules are, but beyond that, it's the player's game. And so if they want to play it as a tactical survival game, great. If they prefer to play it as a horror game and focus on the zombies, great. Some players just prefer the military side of things and coordinating these long, slow campaigns, where in COD you might fire off, uh, you know, you might kill 20 people in, in 20 minutes, or if you're like me, get killed 20 times. <laughs> but um, in a game like this, you may get more satisfaction by just shooting one guy. Yeah. Or by being shot, because it's the story of how that happened. You know, of you and your buddies sneaking up on some gang of guys as they're getting pummeled by zombies, and you wait for the fight to be over and you go in for the gank. Those are the kind of stories we're looking to tell and have players be able to tell. And you're really empowering the, the players to tell those stories themselves. You're yeah. almost giving them the tool set. Does that change SOE's perspective as like it going from just a game design company to more of a tool set development company? It does, and in fact, it's it's been an interesting lesson for us because kind of going full circle to when we were talking about a landmark, it was the, the tool set, we were working really hard to make it good. The, because you know our tools are at best okay, um, and up until this point, and we decided to invest the extra so that anybody could pick it up. By doing that, it kind of opened up this whole new uh, world for us of letting the users come in and do it. And we've doubled down on that. We've actually given tools for players. Um, we have our player studio initiative where we're letting players uh, make things and actually sell them in game. Well, what's cool is we took that to the next level and actually released a tool set. Uh, with that, that goes into Blender, which is a free uh, 3D modeling uh, tool. Right. And we now let users end to end get things all the way into our game. So we really want to empower the users to make, uh, help us make these worlds. How does that change the business model for SOE then? I mean, you, people, a lot of people say they won't play an MMO now if they have to pay a subscription. SOE now has an all access subscription. They, you pay one fee and you get into all the games. Sure. Um, do, you, do you see the subscription model going away? I don't see the subscription model going away. I think it's always going to be around in some way, shape, or form. The way we look at it is um, kind of a basket of value. We want to put enough things in that that players go, huh, okay, I would have bought that and that individually, and I get that for free if I do this. Okay, what the heck, I'll do it. Yeah. Um, that's, we want a, a 
the kind of value that is just kind of a no-brainer for people. Okay. So what do you think is going to be the biggest announcement at SOE Live this weekend? Certainly the one that everybody's looking forward to is EverQuest Next and the class reveals and the, and the live combat, seeing that on stage. It's going to be pretty awesome. Awesome. Will we get release dates for EverQuest Next or H1Z1? Not going to get release dates here. Uh, people, it's, people think we're trying to be coy about them, and it's as simple as we don't know them. Okay. Um, and if we knew them, we would tell them as far in advance as we can. So we're just not sure what they are yet. We're getting close with H1Z1, but uh, you know, EverQuest Next won't be out till next year anyway. Sure. Great. Well, thank you for sitting down and talking to us, John. You got it. We really appreciate it. You got it. Thank you. So we're off now? Okay, so, so we're off the record now. Come on, really, when is H1Z1 going to come out? All right, you got to promise not to say this to anybody, right. but it's going to come out.